this computer. There that is. And now live on Facebook. I'm jealous, Cliff. Okay. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> My friend Sandy Lohr told me about this program. So I'm really looking forward to it. I always enjoy reading about uh, World War II and uh, I'm just very interested to hear what you folks have to tell us today. And Sandy's hiding. She's not letting She's us see hiding. Okay, it's thinking. Oh, here we go. Can you hear me? <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Here's yes, somebody. we can hear you. We can't I'm see I'm just it. looking for a camera, but it's okay if I don't find it because I can see all of you. <laughs> <laughs> if you go down to the bottom, put your cursor down to the bottom. Yeah. And I think uh, there's video there. It says start video. Is that That's all? it. Click on that and then we'll be able to see you. Okay, when, uh, Nothing happened. Okay. Oh, so we're. Oh, here, here it comes. comes. There it is. There it's you go. Green light now. I see you. Good. We see you too. <laughs> I thought there were going to be 70 of us or something. That's what I thought. Come somebody. Good. Oh, there's Kendra. She's my my high school Latin teacher's on. Hi, Kendra. Uh, hi, hi, Lisa. And I will tell you, I had to sign in again. And my friend here in Colorado Springs is trying to sign in too. So somehow we never got a link. So I had to just sign in as the meeting was progressing. So wow. did you we're, register? We're having technical difficulties. Okay. I. We had also registered and didn't get a link and had to re-register in order to get it. We yeah. kept waiting for a link and never got it. Well, I got a link, but it came from a name that I didn't recognize, so I forgot about it. So I registered again, uh, too. Uh, ah. okay, I'm going to tell yeah, my we, friend. We, we did not get the link. I didn't, I didn't get the link either. Yeah. I didn't recognize the name either. Was it a person's name? Was it a John yes. Huddy? John Huddy. Okay, he he is the um, library director, and that's who the probably the accounts under. So that's thank you for letting me know that. So um, oh, it just came it just came up at six eighteen. It just <laughs> came, it just came up. I'm checking from that's when you said John Huddy. Because I I'm like I was saying to somebody I'm constantly learning. So we are. Uh, the Zoom is working. It's preparing to do Facebook. So in just a minute, we'll get started. Um, we are, as I've said to other people, we're, this is streaming on Facebook. So I think there'll be a lot of people that are accustomed to going to Facebook and we'll use that. And right, it's on face. I'm just pulling it up. It did come up on Facebook as well. So somebody sent an email to the library too. Okay, looks like it's live and I, I still says preparing. Well, it, they can have my, okay, or somebody else coming, I think. Might as well get going. I don't see any 
stop recording and okay so welcome this evening here i went back to facebook there we go. Welcome this evening to this evening's program. My name is Barbara Dickinson. I'm the executive director with the Friends of Hanley Regional Library. The Friends have been around since 1977. They were formed to support the Hanley Library at that time, which has now grown into the Hanley Regional Library system, it has the branch downtown Winchester, also a branch uh, Bowman Library in Frederick County and the Clark County Library in Berryville, Virginia. The Friends were always there to support the library through their 501c3. Sometimes that was financial support, sometimes that's raising money, getting a grant. But there was always, always a commitment to bring free programs to the community, like tonight's program. So it's my great pleasure to bring this evening's program. We have a wonderful title called War and Silence. Two writers discuss the European home front during World War II. Our two writers are Sandel Morse. She's the author of The Spiral Shell, A French Village Reveals Its Secrets of Jewish Resistance in World War II. And our other author is L. Annette Bender. She was born in Germany and she immigrated to the US as a child. Um, her debut novel is The Vanishing Sky. And this tells the story of a German mother in 1945 trying to hold her family together uh, at the final months of the war. There'll be time for questions and answer after the program, but, um, and if you want to feel free to go ahead and put anything in the chat room and we will try to help you that way. So I'm um, in my pleasure to introduce Sandale to begin this evening's program. Thank you, Barbara, so much. And thank you to the library and to everyone here. Um, it's truly a, a, a pleasure to, uh, to be on this program with Annette and I, I think, okay, so I know you're supposed to do this, supposed to show your book. So this is my book, The Spiral Shell, and it is at my age, my debut memoir. And I will just briefly tell you two things. One, how I met Annette, and two, how I came to write this book. Um, so the book came out in April, and I uh, did a program with another um, writer at a bookstore in New Hampshire. And after that, the um, coordinator of events said, oh, I have a, I've scheduled this novelist who has also written a World War II book. Uh, would you consider interviewing her? Because by then folks had figured out that two people on Zoom are better than one person on Zoom. And that is actually how I met Annette. And it was so fortuitous. And I guess we need to thank COVID for that because if, that would have been an in-person um, event if it weren't for COVID. Um, I began actually not writing a memoir. I began writing essays. I've been writing for a long time and I've been passing through your neighborhood for many, many years on my way to the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts where I had been a fellow and a board member. And the VCCA also owns a small retreat in a village in France called Ovilar. And I was awarded um, my first residency there in 2011. I had just finished what I considered called my failed memoir. And so I was going to write essays and I got uh, became interested in the um, history of that village. And when I found out it was on the pilgrimage route that leads to uh, the Shrine of St. James in Santiago de Compostela, uh, Compostelo, I began thinking about crusaders and pilgrimage. And of course, whenever I think of that, I think of Jews. And then my thinking leapt to World War II and Vichy France. And I knew basically nothing about Vichy France. And um, I knew very little about Jews at that time as well. And I began my research and through a series of fortuitous events, I met a woman in um, Paris who spoke perfect English and is, was a Jewish historian, a friend of a friend. And she eventually became my translator. And she introduced me to a woman named Germaine Polyakov. And I always say that if this memoir has a main character other than the narrator. It is Germaine. 
She was 92 when we met and she passed away this past um, February at 101. So we had a number of wonderful, wonderful meetings. Um, from my first essay to published book was about nine years. So um, it's, I, I just kept going deeper and deeper. I'm going to show you uh, share screen and show you some slides. And as I do that, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the theme of silence, which we have highlighted. First of all, to orient everyone, um, Paris is pretty much in the north up here. And it was in June of 1940 that um, the, the German army marched into France, into Paris and took the city. So um, people fled to the south for safety because the, uh, the country was divided into occupied and unoccupied zones, but basically the entire country was occupied. Um, the Vichy government was governed by Marshal Pétain, who was a Nazi sympathizer um, and basically a collaborator. So um, the folks that I interview in this book, it not only Germaine, but another woman named um, Yvonne, and I'll talk about her in a minute. They lived in Paris and they eventually ended up down here in bouilleux sur dordogne because um, this was the place where there was a, um, a house that protected Jewish refugee children. And Germaine was a caretaker in that house and Yvonne was one of the children that she cared for. Of course, how they got there is a very, was a very circu circuitous route. Um, and um, Ovilar, I would say, is about down here, which is about a two hour drive uh, to bouilleux sur dordogne But this whole area was filled with both resistance workers, collaborators, and, um, and Nazi soldiers. So that is just to orient you geographically. And this is the house, the secret house in bouilleux sur dordogne And so when we talk about the theme of silence, this secret house was in the middle of a tiny square, right in the middle of, of, of the village. And what you can't see here are things in the foreground. And in the foreground are uh, a statue of the Virgin and Child. And off to the right of your screen in the foreground is the huge Abbey of St. Peter. And opposite these two doors, there is a restaurant and the restaurant is still in existence. And of course I had to eat there one night and just look out at that house. Um, and that restaurant at that time was owned by a Catholic family, the Lopez family, who were all resistance workers. And so they um, rented this house to the Jewish scouts, uh, which was a normal scouting organization during uh, before the war and turned all of their organizational skills to rescue during the war. And what strikes me about bouilleux sur dordogne is that villagers walk to mass every Sunday and they pass this house. And the village historian uh, who I interviewed said, uh, to Le Mans, everyone knew this was a Jewish house. Um, so it was an open secret in the town which I found very interesting. Um, the next photo is of Germaine and her best friend, Sultan. Sultan is a nom de guerre and Germaine's name, nom de guerre was Maki. These young women did not know each other's real, real names. And this is the radio and this is an antenna snaking up and this was illegal and they would listen to French free radio um, very quietly. And this is Germaine on the last time I saw her, which was a year ago this past October. And um, she was and is to me still absolutely stunning. I just miss her. 
Now, Germaine cared for this child as one of the care children that she cared for. And this is Yvonne Leeser. And she um, was born Ingrid Borman in, uh, let's see, she was born in Mannenheim. Oh, Annette, I wish you would do the pronunciations here. Um, <laughs> and she, um, it was on Kristallnacht that, um, well, I'm going to read you that little section, but it was on Chris, the, just shortly after Kristallnacht that Ivan uh, left Germany. Actually, it was in December. And um, here is Ivan uh, on, one, on one of our visits. She was 82 um, when we met, exactly 10 years younger than Germaine. And now she's probably around 92. So um, those are the slides. And also on the theme of silence, one of the things that these women, both Germaine and, um, and Yvonne, did not talk about after the war was their Jewishness. Um, and there were many, many reasons for that. I think there was a feeling among uh, particularly French Jews, and Germain was a French citizen, of having been betrayed because they loved that country and it was the land that, um, that was, was their country. And it was the French gendarmes who collaborated and who rounded up Jews for deportation. And I had no idea that that was the actual reality during that time. And Yvonne um, was more of a practicing Jew than Germaine ever was. But it was talking about the war became taboo because one of the things was it was a very great embarrassment to the French um, and they didn't want to talk about it. And after the war, de Gaulle created a narrative that all of the French were resistant. And of course that wasn't true. Um, so I'm just gonna read you briefly from my first meeting with Germain. And I was a very novice interviewer. I didn't know what I was doing. So, but I did have a few wonderful folks who gave me a few tips. So when things slowed down, I knew that I had to ask a very specific question. So I asked about a single day Germaine remembered vividly. Germaine folded her hands loosely in her lap and spoke of a day in 1944 when German soldiers were marching through Bouillus or Dordogne and heading to Normandy. They were nervous, edgy, and shooting wildly. I was. Germaine rounded her hands and drew a dome in front of her belly, expecting my third child, carrying my baby in one arm, dragging Daniel by his hand and running across a field to the woods. I heard shot. I knew what it was. I wasn't frightened. I felt calm. I don't know why. Naturally, she was frightened, but fear propelled her and gave her strength. A pregnant woman carrying her baby, dragging her toddler, her heart pounding, her belly cramping, adrenaline pumping her legs. I looked into my cup of golden tea. How did she find her way through all that? then integrate into the person she had become. A few days before, Germaine's granddaughter, a woman who became very religious and lived in Israel, had to come to visit with her children, boys who wore payas, side curls. I wanted to make them lunch, Germaine said. They came from so far. I offered a cup of tea. My granddaughter refused. She would not let the boys eat not even a cookie. This woman was the daughter of the baby in Germaine's belly that day she raced for the woods. I knew they were orthodox, still I was insulted. I don't like orthodox. She meant orthodoxy, I agreed. 
Had I been visiting that day, I would have told that granddaughter to forget her rules of kosh fruit that allowed her to eat only kosher foods from kosher plates and to drink only from kosher cups. I would have told her to take a cup of tea with her grandmother to let Germaine give cookies to the boys. Their great grandmother had been to the edge and survived. To break bread, to share a meal with family and friends, this was naches, a Yiddish word that like most Yiddish words squiggled out from under definition. Naches was pleasure, but more than pleasure. Naches was the pure joy a child brought to a parent or grandparent. Speaking English, Germaine said, the more and more I get old, the more I can express what I feel. Only now I realize my life was not ordinary. At the door, Germaine said, people tell me I was courageous to do what I did. I did not know. Perhaps courage is acting not out of bravery, but out of the essence of who you are. Germaine offered her cheek and we kiss kissed. She was tired, she must nap. We talked a long time. You are going back to the States, she said. Yes, I said, I'd been away a month. I had decided that with fairness to, to my husband, a month was the limit for my absences. For years, he provided the financial and emotional support for me to become more than I ever thought I could. And I was grateful. Germaine and I exchanged email addresses. She took my hand and held on. You must tell me when you will return. Not if I would return, when. And I'm gonna stop right there, which is a little shorter than usual. Um, and I'm just going to go on and read very briefly um, a brief section um, about my interview with Yvonne. And this involves Crystal Nacht. And I think that'll segue pretty nicely into Annette's work. Um, Yvonne fingered a honey brown gemstone at her neck and spoke to me of Kristallnacht and the burning synagogue, her father rushing out of their flat and racing to rescue Talit, prayer shawls, and Sidur, prayer books. I'd never been this close to someone who'd experienced that night, the acrid smell of burning building, the sound of storefront windows shattering, the shouts of gangs in the street beating Jews, the cries of terror, Still, her father had run out into the tumult to rescue Torres and Talit. Yvonne said, my father returned. He carried Talit. Police came and took him away. Thugs came. They tore pictures from the walls and threw them into the street. She spoke in short, simple sentences, reducing memory to simple facts devoid of emotion, perhaps because the child who had once lived inside of her was beyond recognition or held so tightly that she remained hidden. I wasn't sure which came first, the thugs or the arrest. Had Yvonne, had Yvonne her sister Marion and Elsa, their mother, stayed in the flat and watched? Or had they sought refuge with a neighbor? How long did the rioting last? She did not know. She laced her fingers on the table, unlaced, laced again. They took all of the Jewish men that night. Later, I heard them singing. Did you see the little Cohen with big ears like a donkey's? Cohen, Jew. She remembered the lyrics of a song that stigmatized, punished, and shamed. She did not remember details of the horror. She stared at a small screen television rabbit ears perched on top. The day after I saw the shops, the broken windows, the burned synagogue. Here in this belly, here in this flat, my belly hollowed out. I could not fathom seeing police take my father away or thugs filling my living room. What had this done to this child? Yvonne remembered a dream. I had a doll. You could turn the arms and legs. I took the doll and I threw it away in the cement yard. The doll broke, then came on fire. 
I was very angry. I saw the doll landing, body, head, arms, and legs smashing, then rising in flames. All through the war, Yvonne dreamed that dream. Now leaning an elbow on the table, she said, I wonder what that doll symbolized. Life as she and her family had known it for generations began its end in 1933 when Hitler came to power. On Kristallnacht, it was finished. So this is of course from the Jewish point of view and I must say that um, The Vanishing, Vanishing Sky has become one of my absolute favorite books. I love this novel. I love the writing. I love the characters and I love the story. And I find it astonishing that and I, Annette and I share rather similar sensibilities about war and silence and people and how it affects ordinary people. Oh, thank you so much, Sandel. And that is so true. I mean, I think, you know, um, particularly people who were children, not yet of age and experienced all these things, uh, both German, Christian, German, Jewish, I think um, if you if you survived that, um, you carried it with you. Uh, what you saw as a child, you carried with you through your adulthood. And in many ways that that feeling was what informed my my writing of this of this novel um, the vanishing sky is the story of a mother named Edda huba who's trying to hold her family together during those last six months of the war uh, Edda's older son max has come home from the eastern front suffering from a mental breakdown and she struggles mightily to hide his decline from the authorities because she knows that they'll be taking him from her if they find out how sick he really is. And at the same time, her younger son, Georg, has run away from his post in the Hitler Youth. He's only 15 and all he really wants is to come back home uh, to be with his mother. And by way of a little bit of background, I'd like to share a little bit with you all as well about the inspiration for the book. So the book is set largely in a town that's inspired by a town named Magdeidenfeld am Main, which means on the Main River. It's in Lower Franconia or Unterfranken in Germany, which is where both of my parents were from. Um, and near this town, there are two even smaller towns across the river from each other, Zimmern, which is where my father was from, and Rodenfels um, across the river where my mother was from. And all of these towns are very close, maybe just 20 odd miles away from the city of Würzburg, uh, also on the Main River. It's a very old, beautiful, historic uh, city that predates the Roman times, um, known for its half-timbered architecture in the old city and also a very well-known, well-regarded university. Um, the city of Würzburg was largely destroyed by the Royal Air Force in a firebombing attack in mid-March 1945. Uh, it had been preceded by a few attacks uh, in February of 45 uh, that destroyed the rail station there. And actually one of my mother's earliest memories is of her father coming home from the city of Würzburg uh, with his winter coat uh, bloodied and torn because he'd survived the attack on the rail station. Um, my father was born in 1930 and speaking of, you know, the idea of silence and the things that you carry with you. And my father was born in 1930. He passed away when I was 16 and never once spoke to me of his childhood in Germany and of his life uh, really at all in Germany. And so I had started writing this novel. It was my first piece of fiction and I don't really know why I had opted to write about a German family. Uh, if someone had told me as a teenager that I would be writing 20 years later about a German family, I would have said, no way, that's absolutely impossible. Because when I came to the US at five and a half, I immediately switched to English. My parents would speak to me in German and I'd answer in English. And yet here I was in my early thirties writing 
And what came to me was this family, and in, in particular, the mother. And so I'd written about 20 pages uh, of this mother's story, of Etta's story. And I decided I was going to snoop around a little bit through the family photo albums that I had not really looked at. <laughs> and um, lo and behold, I found pictures of my father, uh, who at that point had been dead for 15 years. And he was seven in this photograph. It's taken on the school steps in Simon. And I just thought to myself, what a cute little kid he was. He looked so mischievous. And, you know, this was right just a couple of years before the war started. He was just this, this child, uh, an innocent child. And then I came across the final photograph in uh, the childhood portion of this album. And it was my father at the age of 13 or 14 uh, wearing a Hitler youth uniform. And what really struck me uh, immediately about this photograph was the expression on his face and in his eyes. And I saw a sadness in his eyes that I knew very well from the expression he had as an adult. And all of a sudden I realized that this family that I was imagining was missing someone and it was missing this younger boy uh, who was like my father in the Hitler Youth. And so what I did was I went to my mother, since there was no one really left who would remember anything about my father's life. I went to my mother to find out what he might have told her. And much to my surprise, my mother, who had also always been very quiet about her life in Germany, she was much younger than my father. She would have only been five at the end of the war, uh, started telling me what he had told her, uh, which was that his father, who was a teacher, the head school teacher in a small town in Germany, uh, had very high expectations for both his sons. And my father, unlike his older brother, who served on the Eastern Front, my father really struggled to meet his father's expectations and he rebelled. And one thing that he did near the end of the war was that he ran away from his post in the Hitler Youth and tried to get back home. And when I learned this, uh, it, the pieces sort of came together for me and my father was in many ways the inspiration for the younger boy in the Huba family for, for young Georg. And, you know, the wonderful thing about writing fiction is once I realized my father's life and whether he ran and if he did, why he ran, all of these things are a mystery to me and always will be. I mean, they're lost uh, because my father took his stories with them and I was not smart enough at 16 to ask him any questions about his life. Uh, but the wonderful thing about writing fiction is that the Huba family <laughs> became my companions for the eight years that it took to write the novel. And through them, I was able to imagine some of the stories that my father might have told me. And of course, the Hubas are completely different from the Binders. But at the same time, the inspiration really started with this photograph. Um, here are a couple more photographs. My father um, in Canada when he was about 20 and my father and my mother as newlyweds. This would have been probably in 1957. Um, and really, the book could not have been written without my mother. And, so many ways, all the things I failed to do with my father, I'm so grateful to have done with my mom. I spent hour upon hour talking to her, learning about what her life was like, what my father had told her, and also talking to my aunt, my father's um, baby sister, uh, who was even younger than my mother at the end of the war, but who very kindly transcribed my great grandfather's journals of the interwar years that also gave me insight into what it might have been like to have been in a German town, a very small German town, uh, just as things were starting to ramp up again. Um, but a couple of other things that I found were my father's racial purity notebook. And I really have no idea why he kept this or his mother kept this, I'm not sure. But in Germany, every German was required to fill out this book and it had tabs for your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents going back umpteen generations. And you had to show that you had no Jewish heritage um, with either documentation from a town or from a church. And my father did this going back to 1819. And it absolutely chilled me mm. to see this. And the weight of that 
I carried with me as I wrote. Uh, I mean, it's it's this horrible reminder of this of this murderous regime and how it's evil absolutely percolated throughout the entire society. And you know, everyone had to had to fill this out. And if anything was disclosed or discovered about your background, the consequences were catastrophic, of course. Um, the other thing that I found, which was very odd, was my father's cursive notebook, um, learning the old German script. Uh, to learn the letter G when he was nine years old, he had to write Goebbels, 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 Göring, 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 uh, again and again. And again, you know, this, this was chilling to me. It, it's something so ordinary. And yet this horrible regime was working its way through every aspect of life, no matter how trivial. Uh, again, something that I carried with me as I wrote and as I tried to imagine what life might have been like for the Huba family living under a regime like this. Uh, and there he is again, really the inspiration for so much of the book. Um, so I thought I'd read uh, just a, a brief section uh, that I think works so well with Sandel's beautiful memoir. Um, and her very powerful um, account of what she learned from these brave French women. Um, all you really need to know about this is um, the mother, uh, Etta Huba, and she has a dear friend named Ilse, and they've known each other since they were young girls. And they've just had some drinks together. Uh, Ilse makes her own, she sort of steeps her own whiskey. Um, and so they've shared a drink Ilse took Etta to the cellar when it was time to go. She took her down the stairs, past the straw beds where she kept her apples and her plums and lifted her oil lamp high. Etta blinked and her eyes adjusted and she stepped back at what she saw. There were silver candle holders and serving platters and fine inlaid tables. Clocks ticked in the silence of that room porcelain mantel clocks and larger wall clocks propped up one against the other. A grandfather clock stood improbably in the corner and she wondered who had brought it around the house and down those narrow stairs. There were tea sets and goblets and dressing combs, cigarette cases and leather bound books. Porcelain dolls with fine painted faces sat in a row, their blue eyes open and unblinking. Things were stacked neatly against all three walls, wonderful lustrous things that were the pride of their owners, that belonged on dressers and piano tops and dining room hutches, and not in the cellar that was dark and smelled of earth and hay. By God, Edda said, it's a museum you've got here. They're not mine. Ilse drew her hand across a blue silk dress. I'm watching them. It had started with old Frau Singer, Ilse told her, who had come for a visit five years before and sat in her kitchen. Ilse looked around the room. Her voice was low when she spoke. She looked at the clock and nodded at her and her voice shook a little from the liqueur. The old lady had been nervous and held her purse against her lap. They drank coffee together and talked of little things. And when the coffee pot was empty, Frau Singer waited a good while longer before asking. Frau Weinstein came next, and then the young Frau Stern, who had the grandest house of all, high on the hill where the tower stood. They came to her and asked for the same favor, and each time Ilse agreed, because it didn't seem right to say yes to one and no to another. She waved away their offers to pay. Keep your money and your gold, she told them. I'm an old woman and have no need for them. Her cellar became a warehouse of beautiful and cherished things. She came down and dusted the piles every week and she wound the clocks and polished the silver because it tarnished fast in the damp air. When they come back, they'll thank me, Ilse nodded as she spoke. They'll thank me for taking good care of their things. And even as she said it, they both knew it wasn't true. Maybe it was the liqueur, or maybe the coming rain. The roads looked narrower than usual when Etta walked home. The wind bit through her scarf. She thought of those dolls and their patent shoes and all that fine silver and the clocks ticking in the cellar and Ilse keeping watch, just Ilse and her whiskey jars. How hard to be in that house alone with all those things. The air must be thick with ghosts. 
how little she knew about Ilse. More than 40 years together in church every week, they drank their coffee and birthed their babies and knelt together at their family graves and they were mysteries one to the other. Etta stopped once by the bridge and wound her scarf across her mouth. People were inside already. They were drawing their curtains and snuffing out their lights. They huddled close to their wood-burning stoves, which sent up smoke into the sky, gray on gray. People were born in Heidenfeld and buried there, and their children too, and their children's children. They lived in the same houses, one generation after the next, and went to the same schoolhouse and worshipped at the same churches. The buildings outlasted them all, and still people went away. They went away sometimes, carrying only a satchel or a trunk. She'd seen it herself the Weinsteins and the Singers and the Stands who left behind their things, the two sisters who were prone to twitches and to fits, twins who dressed alike and worked side by side for Frau Abing, the seamstress, and they climbed aboard the train one morning and never came back. Young Hillen with his baby face was gone and the gypsies went somewhere too. They were gone from one day to the next and there were no more bonfires by the riverbank then and no more dancing. How easy it was to forget them, Things changed and the mind adjusted and it was an act of will to remember anything at all. Oh, Annette, that is so beautiful. You know, one of the things that's interesting about getting to know someone's work so well is that something occurred to me tonight, right as I was listening to you and your presentation. And I was suddenly struck that there is a similarity between your father's um, notebooks, the racial purity um, and uh, the notebooks and his hiding them for basically his entire life, but wanting them to be discovered. And, and obviously, I mean, that's just my take on it because he did not destroy them. And, um, I think that the hiding, uh, Ilse's hiding of those uh, possessions of the Jews who left were not so much that everybody believed they were coming back, but that it was a story that needed to be told. Mm -hmm. I don't know, am I totally off base with that? No, I think that's a really uh, perceptive and interesting uh, thought that I had not thought of before. I mean, I, I wondered why my father had kept these notebooks and I thought maybe it was his mother who kept them. Uh, once my mom had these things, she was going to keep them forever because my mom kept every single piece of paper I think that ever came into our house uh, and it was very organized and tidy. Uh, but you know why they were kept in those years right after the war is, is a mystery to me. And I think there, there is truth to that, that maybe at some level uh, though he knew that it was a story there that and that, that to destroy them would be wrong. Mm. To erase that story um, would be would be wrong. Uh, and you know, I, I wonder often about people who who live with that knowledge, especially people who weren't really small, like my mother who was five, you know, but people who were kids during the early period of the war, but young teenagers or young adults by the end of the war and who came of age under those circumstances and what they what they grappled with and what they carried in their lives um i mean it's a mystery that i wish i'd asked my father about mm -hmm. uh, but in some ways i i found some memoirs uh, written by um people who were in the hitler youth this one in particular you can see from the many tabs on it um alphonse hex a child of hitler uh, Germany in the days when God wore a swastika is a very brave um, account of his complete indoctrination. He was a complete believer in it, and it took him his entire adulthood to come to terms with what he'd believed and what he'd willingly gone along with as a as a boy and as a young man. Uh, so I think I think there's truth to that. I think people probably do feel that there's a story there, and they're unwilling to part with it, but they're also in many cases, unwilling to tell it. Yes, yes. Um, and, you know, in I discovered in my research that um, there were actually Jewish families deported from Ovilar, the village that I visited and, and 
and loved and where I uncovered a lot of these stories. Um, and there is a, a story in the memoir about a family um, whose suitcases were discovered in a locked room in the, uh, in the town hall, Le Marie, more than 50 years after that family was deported. And they were sealed with the tape, the official tape of the gendarmes. And so when this workman opened the door and saw them, he knew exactly what they were. And so I too am fascinated by this, uh, this keeping of, of these objects, yet also keeping them secret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's the weight, uh, the weight of it, you know, I think um, in some ways they might be unwilling to, to let go of it. Um, but again, telling it is just too hard. For telling it is too hard that there seems to be something in us that um, sort of wants our history and wants truth and wants things known. Um, or at least in some of us. Um, I also ran into an interesting uh, story when um, when I was uh, in the book, I don't wanna to give too much away, but uh, made a discovery about um, a place uh, where a Gestapo arrest took place. And um, someone got wind of this. And I went there with two friends, one French and one German who married a French woman and had retired to Ovilar. And I was told that they received a phone call and then they received a note from someone um, in a nearby village that said, that didn't happen there. There was no arrest. There was no Gestapo. And there was Gestapo. Mm -hmm. So that is like in the, um, in this, in the century. Yeah. That, that still lingers for some people and they can't face it. So oh, that's yeah. another kind of silence. So do you think we should open for questions? Sure. Comments? Well, I have a question if I may. Well, we, <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> First of all, Sandel, as you may recall, we met in Ovilar at VCCA in 2011. <laughs> Didn't we meet in Virginia? Well, we might have. I think we met there after uh, Ovalar, but we certainly oh, met. Okay. But anyway, and so we were there together. So um, I'm glad to hear you talk about Ovalar and its um, role in in your book, which I find fascinating. And Annette, I also loved your story too. I uh, look forward to reading both books. But what I wanted to ask is if either of you are familiar with, that you probably are, uh, Sweet Frances by Irene Nemirovsky, um, which tells a story that seems a little similar to what you're doing, Sandel, in uh, reporting in your book um, about fleeing Paris to um, the Southwest, to uh, a village and ultimately being hidden, but then discovered. Yes, I, I absolutely adore that book. Um, and I, um, I think that her story is so unique because she really uh, never, uh, I think up until the end, really uh, wanted any part of a Jewish identity. I think with the characters, the people in my book, I think Germaine, um, knew she was Jewish. Uh, she wasn't, she was, was her secondary identity, I would say. Um, she really considered herself French. And before the war, she was engaged to marry a Catholic man. And it was during the war um, and, uh, that she really developed a, a Jewish identity, but she wanted no part of ritual. She wanted no part of Jewish practice. And, um, so she really considered herself a, a secular Jew. Um, Yvonne, um, but uh, Nemirovsky was uh, really feeling betrayed, I think, by, um, by the French and by, the Fr by French culture. She really had, really had no identity as a Jew. Would you agree with that, Cliff? 
Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Uh, but what, what was also fascinating about her book, of course, is that she wrote it before we knew how horrible the situation was. And obviously before she knew, um, since she died, but um, the, when we write about that period now, from our perspective, we write a whole different story because we know what happened. Um, and that really does change the color of anything we write about that period. Yes, I think what was also amazing was that she was able to write a book with that depth um, as events were happening, as they were unfolding. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, one of the challenges of the book is that my, my book is set in those final six months uh, of the war and it's written in close third person. So all you really know is, all, all the characters know is what they know in that moment. There's no benefit of hindsight. Uh, there's no sort of benefit of historical context at all, uh, but it's also much more immediate as a result. Uh, and so, you know, I think the reader in, in my case knows much more than the characters do. And that's a different reading experience. Um, Oh, that's a wonderful point, Annette. That 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 is absolutely true, and that's I think where um, the sympathy for them develops in that that kind of their their knowing and their not knowing, and their understanding and their not understanding um, really gives um, gives the gives the novel or gives the reader a great deal of sympathy for for those characters and their lives. And also that there's variety, you know, there's, there's variation even within a family in terms of what people believe and, and what they know and how much they may be in denial about. Uh, and so I think, you know, in, in every instance, both in your memoir and in my novel, it's an attempt to unflatten history. It's an attempt to sort of bring these stories back to life and make them immediate uh, in a way because at least from the German perspective, when we look back on that time now, from, from our view, vantage point now, we tend to think of the Germans either as being all the sort of villainous Germans, you know, the, the people who are true believers at the rallies, or we think of them as being isolated individual heroic characters resisting the regime. And we miss all of the stories, the sort of fine texture of the stories of the people who are in the middle, who are trapped in the regime and maybe unable to resist or too scared to resist um, and maybe in denial at the same time about the magnitude of what was happening. And I think without the benefit of hindsight, when you're in that immediate moment, it makes you realize that it's always very hard to tell in the moment what, what is happening. Uh, and it, I think it does, it creates sympathy, but it also helps us, I think, understand how things are now, both in your memoir and in my novel. I think it's, it's, it has a message for life now and that it's sometimes hard to tell what's happening when you're in the middle of something, of historical events. So do we have any other questions out there? Feel free to unmute yourself, anyone. Um, I don't see anything in the chat chat screen right now. I know we have people who are watching us who have written themselves, so understand completely the process. Oh, I believe Ethel, maybe you have a question. Um, I, I just have a comment. Um, I had only a short uh, visit to Germany when my daughter and son-in-law and family were living there. And we did a little bit of um, sightseeing around Frankfurt. I wish I could remember the name of the little town we went to. It was a, um, a, a town with a factory in it, but there had been an archbishop's palace that was turned into a museum. And in that museum, there was, um, one floor dedicated to what happened to the Jews in that town. Mm -hmm. And it showed pictures of wonderful family groups, beautifully dressed and, you know, large family groups and their businesses. 
and then it showed Kristallnacht and it happened. And then as you went farther in that room, there was a plaque with the names of everyone and where they died. Mm. And I was so impressed with that, um, that the people in that town would put up that truth for the world to see anyone who came. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this a man in the book, Gerhard Schneider, who um, said to me that the French were not where the Germans were in 1945, 46, 47, 48 in facing their past. And maybe it, it was because the German past was so horrendous, but they have done a marvelous job of honoring and, um, and remembering. Um, of course, now we've got a few neo-Nazis coming along. <laughs> Uh, but it seems to never end, um, but it never ends here either. You know, I think there are aspects of what happened in Germany that came to light much later. I think what, what Germany did with its mentally ill, like at the hospital, the university um, psychiatric hospital in Wurzburg, you know, that has really only come to light within the last 15 years or so, the magnitude of the, the mass murder of the mentally ill and the use of their bodies uh, for dissection lab at the medical school that was affiliated with the psychiatric clinic. Um, and so I think it, the magnitude of it is something that is, even now there, there's parts of it that are still coming to light. And you know, the, the, the doctor who ran that murderous clinic escaped uh, from his prison in Germany and ended up becoming uh, and he lived under an assumed identity, but everyone knew who he was, and he continued to practice medicine years later. And so I think that the sort of complicity, it's such a complicated terrain with people who are trying to do the right thing and are trying to bring to light what happened, and then people who are still covering for some of the perpetrators. And uh, it's a very complicated terrain for sure. Same thing happened in France. A lot of the collaborators ended up in um, high government positions. Do we have any other questions out there? Yes. Um, I hope anybody has any questions, feel free to contact me. I can pass it on to our authors. Um, the, as I mentioned again, the library does not yet have these books, so I encourage you to go out there and go to your local bookstore. The uh, Winchester Book Gallery was aware of this and has planned to order some of these books, or you can order them. They have a really nifty online site. Um, so maybe Claudia, do you have a comment? Yeah, good. Thank oh, you. Excellent program. Thank you so much. Lots to look up and lots to um, think about. Well, if, um, if you do read the book and you have any questions or comments, and I'm sure Annette is open to this too, I'm easily contacted through my website, sandelmorse.com, and I'd be happy to chat with you, have an email, and I will also be happy to mail you a, uh, a book plate if you would like for the book. How nice, the thank, thank you. Both of the works sound really interesting. I'm looking forward to reading them both. Thank you. Me too. I I had it sort of in this pristine way back then and how much it's it's very pertinent today to what things we're seeing, like you said, seeing going on in our own time. So thank you so very much. It's much appreciated. Lovely, lovely program. Thank you for the time. Thank, thank you both. Thank, thank, thank you. you for organizing it also. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, thank Teresa. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye.